We get this meeting started, we are going to heaven. When we have the prayer, as far as we're going to have the prayer, then we're going to have you lead us in our place. Are we now live? Back here, we're good to go. So, thank you everybody for being here. I want to call the Griffin Spalding County School Board uh, meeting to order on September 1st. Here's the meeting at 6 o'clock. If everyone would uh, put your electronic devices on silent or uh, turn them off, we would appreciate those that are online. Keep yourself muted until you need to talk. Uh, at
At this time, I would like to uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Brown, for our school spotlight. Mr. Chair, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present our school spotlight. Uh, we started this over a year ago, and we are excited that we have, today we have represented each school in our school district. So today we are happy, we are excited, we are glad to spotlight the Griffin Region College and Career Academy, as well as Program Challenge. So our first spotlight will be the Griffin Region College and Career Academy. How many scholars attend your school? 365 for the fall 2020 semester. GHS has a total of 123 scholars. SHS has a total of 129 scholars that attend there. And the others are from Jackson, Georgia, um, Pike County, and then AZ Kelton has one scholar that attends the Region College and Career Academy. What is your school mascot? We do not have a mascot, but our motto is preparation meets opportunity. How many faculty and staff members work at your school? We have three high school instructors, one paraprofessional, 20 Southern Crescent Technical College instructors, four Gordon College instructors, five Griffin Region College and Career Academy staff members, and three Region College and Career Academy technical agriculture education staff members. A quote from the principal on why you love being the proud principal of school. I am extremely proud to be a part of this wonderful program that provides a variety of opportunities for all GXCS scholars. Whether they are a student that wishes to get a jump start on their college career, with doing enrollment credits, the scholar that wishes to earn technical certificate or diploma and go directly into the workforce after high school, or to continue a technical degree, or the scholar that wishes to graduate on an alternative option and complete their ninth and 10th grade year of academics, and then pursue a technical program in a high demand, high wage field. The possibilities are endless for students in Griffin's Baldwin County schools. And like our model states, preparation is opportunity, and the GRCCA prepares scholars for life. That in itself makes me extremely proud, especially when you have scholars that graduated with associate degrees certified pharmacy technicians, certified nurse aides, certificates in welding, German apprentice, and 30 plus dual core academics, and the list goes on. We welcome business and opportunity to showcase all of the accomplishments of our students. What good things are going on at school, socially, and education? The GRCCA has wonderful and dedicated staff that are all eager to assist and meet the needs of our scholars. We have a student center available for our students and socially distanced but yet socialized. We offer tutors in conjunction with our college partners. We teach and promote employability skills. We have an ambassador program that offer leadership opportunities. We have fabulous technical labs that offer real life credentials recognized by employers. Our new aviation hangar is open for students interested in flight operations, aviation maintenance, and unmanned air assistance, and undoubtedly one of a kind in Georgia for high school students. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the 2020 Spotlight to Griffin Regent College and Career Academy. Director of the school. 
As Executive Director of Elementary Education, I am extremely proud to serve and support Pearl Challenge for several reasons. Firstly, I am so proud of the hardworking, wonderfully creative, intellectually curious, and remarkably collaborative gifted elementary scholars that participate in the program. We have nearly 300 gifted scholars in kindergarten through fifth who inspire me and so many others every day to demonstrate innovation, to boldly push the frontiers of their own intellectual and academic prowess, and develop new and different opportunities to serve the community and each other in a manner that improves the world around them. Whether it's learning to utilize the tennis or forensic science, or creating video animations to articulate their points of view on important topics they've researched, or calculating the statistical probabilities of weather-related phenomena, or investigating and solving real-world problems through Odyssey of the Mind service projects, or even demonstrating for our community partners their immense interpersonal communication skills of the Mind service projects. Through the great working shape experience, our program challenge gifted scholars continues to show the world that there are no limitations to the heights that our Griffin Spawn scholars can soar to. Our program challenge scholars routinely outperform their great peers throughout the region, state, and country on math assessments. Every time I observe a class at Program Challenge, I am reminded of the highly intellectual, wonderfully collaborative, ever courteous, selfless, and service-oriented scholars that permeate the Griffin Spawn County School. You have to say about this office. The Griffin Spawn County School System. Another reason I am so proud to serve and support the Challenge is due to the most dedicated scholar center, high professional, and exemplar team of teachers and staff I have ever had the privilege to serve with. From the Challenge teachers, Mrs. Marty Bailey, Dr. John Barnes, Mrs. Amy Brown, and Mrs. Kara Cook, professional assistant, Mrs. Lynn Bailey, and head custodian, Mr. Tony Weston are the absolute cream of the crop when it comes to maintaining the highest quality relationships with scholars and each other, modeling kindness, making decisions focused on student needs, planning, and with precision, exceeding expectations, and thinking outside the box to broaden the scholars' perspectives and experiences for the benefit of their long and lifelong learning success. Our Chrome Challenge scholars are immensely better for these stellar professionals. So many Chrome Challenge alumni and their families routinely reach back to us and express how well positioned they were for success in school, community, and life due to their past work with program challenge staff and their past participation in the program. This is no surprise given how much time, effort, attention to detail, and care for the scholars that our past and current program challenge staff have exuded for 25 plus years in the history of the program. In that time, educators from around Georgia have come to visit our center, including recently, to learn about how well the program is running. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, let us stand and give a round of applause to our program challenge staff and our executive director that supports them as they come and set the school spotlight for September 21st. Thank you so much.
Father, thankful for the privilege of serving on this same board and the opportunity of leading and teaching us as they prepare for their future. We pray for our children with all the issues that we are facing. We pray for those that are dealing with the effects of the pandemic. We pray for all of those who are ill and have other issues that they are facing. In the midst of all this, Father, help us remember your commandment to be kind to one another. And now as we go into this session, with the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the Master's name, we will be so prepared. Amen. Responding 
uh, to your comments, but again, I want to thank you for being here to do that. Uh, the first person I have on my list that is here is Mr. Lee Cohen. Have you thanked the teachers 
or told me what a good job they're doing from one of these meetings. Who's out there doing the work? Every one of them that set up their talk last week never once said, our teachers are doing a great job. Not one of them. You're about to step down, Mr. Smith. Get rid of the garbage and get somebody here that wants to work. Get rid of the garbage or somebody has to come in here and take it over. Mr. Thomas, you want to the board. I'm not retracting my statement. It's sorry. You're at, you're at your time. These schools aren't ready to open because the staff that works downtown can't get it right. They cannot get it right because they want to sit there and pat themselves on the back and talk about what they're doing. Well, I can tell you what they're doing. They're ruining the school system. That's what they're doing. They're stressing their teachers out. They're stressing their kids out. My kid gets off the computer in the afternoon and can't stop blinking his eyes for the rest of the day until he closes his eyes and goes to sleep. It's too much. It is absolutely too much. Get it right. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Next on our list, we have Ms. Patricia Johnson.
And we didn't get hand sanitizer until I spoke to someone in central office. No, I came on my lunch break one day to speak to someone in central office. She called the head person. They didn't know when the hand sanitizer was delivered. So that's a systematic issue. That's a system. Something's wrong with the system when there is no documentation of when supplies are delivered to a school. So it's at that moment that I decided that I needed to only, not only protect myself, protect my family and other uh, elderly members of my family from potentially contacting the virus. If we weren't prepared for virtual learning, I don't know where the faith is going to come from with our teachers and staff and parents that we're going to be ready for moving into the, the school buildings. This is unprecedented times. So for a middle school, the only middle school that was on a traditional schedule, up until, up through today, It, it doesn't make any sense. What a response was, when approached by our admin to central office, the schedule needs to look, mirror what it looks like when they return to the building. Nothing mirrors the time that we're in now, so why not plan for the time we're in now? Moving on to health and wellness as it relates to our staff. Along with the unprecedented times of the pandemic, we have an unprecedented time in terms of social justice. And I think I'm from the North, so I've, I've been living in the South for years, and I don't think that this issue is just isolated to the South. This is an issue that this district, and I may be wrong, has failed to address and equip ourselves once the students come back. My school is incorporating a cultural relevance and proficiency team. And I would suggest that be part of the environment, part of the training, moving forward for all schools. Because it's not only affecting, we're not on an island here, it's affecting the whole world, the whole country. So my suggestion is that some type of cultural relevance and proficiency training happen within the schools, starting with the staff because we can't teach children until we get right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Me, my colleague, and this gentleman, he is correct. 
realm that can do them all that is one. The teacher gets from the age of 10 to 4. Except the third day you have a bunch of you still trying to do something. Because you, in between you have meetings. So it's something every day. If I got a clock, what the teacher's doing every minute of the day. So we're like live. So what y'all don't understand is, as I said in my letter, the expectation y'all have for children are just every day they get going for them. Because children are not there, what they do, they check in. Because y'all said they do have to check in in two days, two classes, and complete one sign. What you gonna do? You'll come Monday. You might come Wednesday. You want to find them. So they're not even have a handle, but teachers' expectations are here. Then attendance is due on Monday. Y'all are coming up on Monday to Sunday to do work. But then you want teachers to do with attendance on Monday. How? When you class teacher, you have to literally go into every class to check to see who checked in on that check-in sheet that y'all made and we have to do. Then you have to go see to do a sign. That's too much for us. Four classes and first period. That's five classes. Last Monday, I finished to 5 or 5 when I clocked out. I thought Ms. Bell set the alarm at office school because she waited. Because I said, I'm not doing this when I get home. Sitting here all day, without a kid up here, I have no desire to get on the home book or anything to do any school related work. Yesterday, I did it again, so I had to take it home. It was 9 o'clock. That's, that's, that's not fair to me. I have underlying conditions, but I chose one to deal because I don't want to be dealing with the words of food issues, because that's what it is. And then when grades come out, because children are not doing work, then it's going to be on the TV because your parents are going to run down here to y'all. I'm going to go to the board. You teach them like my children, but then they're not doing their work. And then how am I supposed to call, call parents? You try to call when the children are working. And it can be. But then that's still, I try to do it, that's still a lot. It's like y'all are really, Y'all just don't want to teach because we are tired. It's not, it's just the day is September 1st, and we are tired. I have people in my school that on blood pressure, you have to go on blood pressure tests last week because they are doing too much. I have one of our team members today, she had to leave me today because they are not, it is too much. Teachers are doing, y'all are here, y'all making us do so much, but then the children are doing nothing. Y'all do this since March. And you got to read, I signed for PPE on last Thursday, August 27th. I got a face shield, a mask, and sanitizer. But we've been in the building since July the 27th. We're not ready for kids to come back in the building. I'm not ready for teachers to be in the building. There's a white sitting there, there's no white, but I have my own because my family could help me prepare myself. So when I go to the restroom bathroom, when I go to use the copy of it, I have to take what I need to clean so that I don't take myself with the issues that I have. And then I'm going to let the for teachers to come to the class, come back. I hope that that is presented, that it is not voted on that teachers do virtual and in-person at the same time. Now that is not possible. Because you cannot teach a group of kids and then you got to move over here on, online and you try to teach them. That is not going to work. That shouldn't even be an option. It should be the one or the other. Y'all are little teachers. You are. Like I told Dr. Sauce and Dr. Kenny and the me last night I met with them. Y'all have to think about putting yourself in these teaching teacher classes. Think about what we have to do every day. We are part of proving ourselves with work, trying to plan lessons, this stuff virtually. But it's like the more we do, it don't matter. Because we are tired. At 4, 15, 4, 4, 10, 15, people out of the field. I was doing little girls out there. Because everybody's tired. 
So y'all please think about teachers. Think about these children. Monday needs to be a day a teacher work day where teacher, kids are working virtually or something that teacher can do this attendance thing that y'all want. Y'all know why that y'all don't want to give us that day. Y'all want to be flexible about everything. Y'all don't want to be flexible with the teachers. Be flexible with the children. Oh, they got to be there. Mom got to have them if they were. Be flexible with them. But when it comes to teaching, y'all don't want to be flexible. Y'all want to give us. We know we can help. But what we do have to give us. We just need y'all to understand where we're coming from. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jordan, do I have anyone else that is present for public? No. I heard you say no. No. And do we have anyone online? No. All right, brother, four minutes. We will then move to our consent agenda. I would entertain a motion for a consent agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It seems like March 13th was a long time ago. The last time we had students and teachers face to face in the classrooms. And then COVID has kind of caused a very long, long, hard disruption. Since then, we've been undergoing various procedures, protocols, and processes to mitigate the spread of the virus and work hard to do so. As the 2021 school year approached, our team has put together several plans to facilitate a mixture of in-person and remote work opportunities. We began the formal school year on August 17th in an all-remote learning environment. It has not been easy, and uh, perhaps not ideal. But I will say this, our teachers have shown an amazing ability to be creative and resilient in working in that environment. We have all been impressed with the work we have seen in the virtual classrooms and the comments we've gotten back from them. So I do appreciate it very much for our teachers and our staff have done it because this is not the way they normally teach. But they have to, have to find a way to adapt. And I think they have worked very creatively and very hard to do so. At the, at the August 18th meeting, the board asked the staff to develop a plan that can lead to a reopening of our school buildings to in-person learning along with a timeline to accomplish that. And in the last two weeks, our community and members of our task force have worked on such a plan, getting feedback from a wide variety of our school staff and across the, the, the district, including parents and students. And so tonight, our community and others of the task force will present that plan that we feel meets the criteria for a safe reopening in school along with the option for continuation of the moment. Okay.
are going to transition to in-person learning while continuing with the remote learning option. Next slide. As we move into the presentation, I believe that it is important to note that we have continued to monitor data and onboard guidance as we have discussed and developed plans with our starter school task force. Uh, this includes continuing to monitor community data, continuing to follow CDC guidelines, and Georgia Department of Public Health recommendations to help mitigate the spread and continuing to partner with our local health department and emergency management agencies. As we prepare to transition into in-person learning, we know that our main focus has to be on mitigating strategies for students and staff, which includes social distancing, minimizing exposure, face coverings, cleaning and hygiene, monitoring for symptoms, and implementing COVID-19 response protocols. We will touch on each of these points during this presentation in various ways. Next slide. The GSES Star School Task Force has identified a seven-week timeline for planning and staff purposes to transition to an in-person option while continuing to offer the remote learning option for our students and parents. The task force has discussed at length the amount of time it will take to make a smooth transition, as well as the necessary steps and tasks that will have to be implemented over the course of that time frame. This includes a multitude of tasks that will have to be accomplished each week. And so at this time, we're going to take a look as to what those tasks are during the timeline. Next slide. Starting the seventh out, we will need to launch the GSES Learning Model Selection Survey to all parents and guardians in order to identify the number of students who will choose the option of returning to in-person instruction or remaining with remote learning instruction. Parents and guardians will have 10 days to complete the survey. Once they have identified either remote or in-person, we're asking parents and students to, com to commit to remaining in that option for the remainder of the first semester. From there, we will uh, have communication and partnerships to vision. We'll launch a communication video that fully explains the in-person transition process and uh, strategies that we have in place. We will take the skills assessments for the virtual environment data, and that will be distributed to uh, principals by human resources. Teachers with approved accommodations may have to reapply based on the change in circumstances. And principals will begin to work with administrative services to identify any additional materials that may be desired for completion of their school level operations plans that they are currently working on with their school level task force. The special education department will develop a communication plan for the special education reintegration plan, which we will explain fully in details later during this presentation. Dr. Dr. Kennedy, just one second. Yes. Being told that nobody online can hear what's going on, so just, can you check that and come out for me, please? Can you check again? Before we text anyone? All right, we're going to allow you to begin, and then if we go, we'll see feedback if it's working. Yeah, we have. I have several edits. Okay. There's some text that's been here. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Yes, six weeks out, the Human Resources Division will continue to work with each principal as he or she identifies their pool of remote learning teachers for in-person teaching. 
features uh, utilizing several pieces of data. Principles and instructional technology will continue to deliver professional learning to address teacher needs as identified by the skills self-assessment for the virtual environment and curriculum training on the determined instructional model of the schedule. The curriculum department will review data to determine if there are any adjustments that need to be made to the units, the RCD units, and the special education department will meet with special education teachers involved in the reading integration plan, implementation, and analyze the needs for any additional PPE for classes in collaboration with the administrative services division. Special education staff will initiate parent contact to discuss the in-person option. Next slide. Five weeks out. Our schools will have completed their school level operations plans with their school level task force. Schools principals will make determinations regarding staff member services based on the GSCS learning model survey data. Training on the term instructional model will continue. Schools will balance out their classrooms to allow for social distancing as much as possible based on the numbers that we receive. All students who have chosen to remain in remote learning will be identified as remote learning students in our Anthony campus system. We will continue to see if there are any adjustments uh, that will need to be made to the RCD units. And our special education department will create class lists and provide lists to principals, transportation department, and nutrition department. Identified teachers will begin lesson planning processes for the special education and reintegration plan. Next slide. Four weeks out, schools will continue to work with administrative services on materials and supplies. Schools will re-roster students whose teacher is unable to conduct in-person instruction due to medical accommodations. Based on survey data, the transportation uh, needs for all students will be updated in a registration form provided by the transportation department. Training on the instructional model will continue. There will continue work on the RCD units if needed. Then we have a plan for communicating that all work is finalized and submitted by students for grading purposes as face-to-face -face instruction begin, begins uh, will be developed. And plans will be made for sharing grades or students' progress for 20 teachers. The special education department will conduct walkthroughs of our classrooms to ensure readiness for implementation of special education reintegration plan, and parents will be contacted to confirm attendance. Next slide. Three weeks out, we will have our district and school level communication sent out to our stakeholders. Schools and classrooms will be set up to receive students, and the special education reintegration plan will be implemented. Two weeks out, teachers will start planning for receiving students. Building walkthroughs will be conducted by school and district administrators to make any final adjustments or changes if needed. And then one week out, final adjustments or changes will be made for the first day of in person learning. These are all of the major items that will take place over the course of the seven week period. Next slide. Here we're going to delve into uh, some of the plan and look at some specifics. When you click the top link, please. Thank you. This is our GSCS transition to in-person remote learning plan. The task force has worked diligently um, to meet with subcommittees as well as meeting as a task force group numerous times over the uh, last month to make pertinent decisions that were needed to update the plan that was originally uh, identified as option one. Uh, back in uh, June for reopening of schools. You can scroll down, uh, starting when you will see the table of contents, um, and you will see those items listed there that are included, a list of the task force and subcommittee members, the transition plan, and the person model, 
COVID response, transition plans by school, remote learning model, combined components of both, and then frequently asked questions. And we can move to page seven. find a brief background for the work of the task force that you will see there and then also move to, to the seven week timeline that we've already reviewed. Uh, I do want to know that an in-person plan would have to be one of flexibility because there will be times depending on the focus status that occurs within the school community that we will need to flex in and out of in-person learning and remote learning if needed to mediate any possible spread. Uh, at this time, I, just, I will go through and just highlight uh, a few specific topics, um, starting with uh, staffing on page 10. This is where our human resources division will work closely with principals as they, as they make decisions and determinations about the most effective staffing for their individual buildings. I did want to commend here uh, Shanika Freeman, who's our teacher representative for the task force. She's also our teacher of the year. Uh, Ms. Freeman was asked to uh, lead a 24 teacher staffing committee to discuss staffing options uh, because we wanted to gather feedback directly from teachers around what staffing possible staffing options could look like and, and looking at that input. And she did a great job with that and brought that information back to the task force. And uh, that discussion actually led to this decision around staffing. Uh, which is that it would be a flexible uh, situation that maybe teachers who would be teaching remote learning as well as in person because we have some singleton classes for different individuals in uh, specific certifications. There may be teachers who would be designated as a remote learning teacher only or an in person teacher only. And there may be teachers who are teaching either remote learning or in person based on settings. And uh, that was some input that was gathered from the high school um, area specifically. So you can see that the staff would have flexibility to allow principals to work through making those decisions along with support uh, and working with the teachers and support from the human resources, the resources division as they identify the uh, best staff for their individual schools. Well, Between pages 11 and 20, you will find detailed information regarding curriculum, grading, along with specified programs to include special education, ESOL, gifted services, pre-kindergarten, dual enrollment, CTAE, MTSS, extracurricular activities, and our after school program. So here you will find all of the specifics as it relates to in-person um, learning as to how those areas will look and operate. On page 20, On page 20 and page 21, there is specific information around promoting behavior to reduce the spread, as well as maintaining a healthy environment. Here's where you will find staff and student training videos and information for educational purposes around COVID-19, and specific safety protocols for in schools, nutrition department, transportation, and visitors. I do want to take a moment to point out these specifics starting on page 21. These guidelines are based on CDC and the Joint Public Health uh, Department. We have also uh, developed a cleaning and sanitizing plan um, that you will hear from Mr. Agents 
um, later in the presentation. But I do just want to touch quickly on page 21. Some of the specifics around maintaining a health, healthy environment. And so, of course, uh, definitely uh, foremost, we want to encourage students and staff to stay home when safe more if they do not feel well. Providing sanitizer on buses and in classrooms. Provide sanitizer stations at multiple entry points in schools' locations. Providing cups for drinking water, supplying gallon jugs of water and cups to classrooms that do not have sinks. Eliminate field trips for the first semester and we will reassess those as we go move towards second semester. Providing appropriate PPE and equipment to all personnel. All students and staff shall wear face masks covers in, in common areas and in classrooms where distancing cannot be, when the six-foot distancing cannot be maintained. Students and staff members may bring their own face covering and mask, or one will be provided for them. Restrooms and common areas will be disinfected briefly. We will be minimizing visitors to school facilities. We are turning off common water fountains. Uh, we will make sure that there's uh, circulation of fresh air into the building. We will provide signage, thermometers, face covers, a mask, face shields, gloves, sanitizing chemicals, spray bottles, disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer, antibacterial following, hand soap. Frequent sanitation of classrooms and provide teachers or staff with sanitizing spray that they can use if they choose throughout the day, but we are asking everyone to just spray down. Uh, they don't have to wipe off, but to spray their uh, area as they're leaving for the day. Having custodian staff concentrate on hot tub areas and residents multiple times throughout the school day. We have a protocol to isolate, deep clean, and sanitize the impacted classroom spaces and supply paper or materials for schools to make their own additional specific school uh, signage as they need to. In nutrition, uh, we will be providing meals into go to containers for all students via meals. Students will come to the urban line in the cafeteria. Uh, nutrition, we are also encouraging parents to utilize my payment plus. Um, so that we can minimize the exchanging of funds and money uh, at the uh, point of sale. And we will not have our car sales for students and staff to limit the exchanging of items and money at the cashier terminal in order to cut down a checkout time per student or staff at the terminal. For transportation, our bus drivers and students will wear face covers or masks for the bus. Buses will be cleaned and disinfected daily. And we will ask parents and encourage parents to transport their students if that will help us minimize or reduce the number of students on the bus. But bus loads will not be adjusted for social distancing. For visitor procedures, we will limit visitors. Visitors will be by appointment only. We also would like to minimize others in the classroom, which will mean no classroom volunteers will be allowed and this will be reassessed throughout the school year. Parents will be asked to remain in cars during morning drop-off or pick-up. Temperature checks for all visitors, vendors, uh, require face coverings, masks for all visitors, and maintenance and our nutrition visitors will be checking in uh, in the front office and nutrition vendors uh, with the cafeteria manager. Then you will note that we do have on page 22 through 24 information uh, provided regarding health screening, health protocols, and our COVID-19 response. All students and staff will complete temperature screenings. There is an item for tonight's agenda that Mr. Akers will bring forth to support the temperature screening process. 
Students have identified isolation rooms that will be utilized for individuals showing symptoms. And we have established staff and student COVID response protocols as well. And Mr. Akins will be speaking in reference to the student response protocol shortly. On page 25, you will see guidance. Provided to schools as their starting school task force teams develop their school operation plans. When those plans are completed, if you could scroll down, please. When those plans are completed, the individual school school plans will be linked into this document in this section. And so that's where um, that table, or that table is there. We will link those plans into this particular area. Then on page 27, which is right here, you see our remote learning model starts. And individuals are familiar with remote learning. This is our current operation of remote learning process and procedures. And then once you move to the ending, of this section on page 36, you will find the frequently asked questions. For uh, in-person and remote learning, uh, this document is also linked in the presentation as well as the text assembly. The LAQ document provides questions and responses regarding in-person and remote learning, safety and sanitizing questions, school transportation questions, health protocol and screening questions, specialized program questions, and staff questions are included in the LAQ. I do want to bring your attention to the statements at the bottom of page 47 last page. Which uh, simply states that we will uh, continue to look at our instructional model options as we move forward because they are subject to change depending on the Spalding County's transmission data the Joint Department of Public Health guidance, CDC guidance, governor's executive orders, our guidance that we received from Joint Department of Education, guidance from our local, uh, our district court health department, and local emergency management guidance. There are many times when the district and schools move in and out of in-person learning and remote learning models depending upon the status of COVID-19 data in the district and the school community. If we go back to the presentation slides. Okay. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Anthony Agins to come forward, our Executive Director of Administrative Services, and he will be reviewing the cleaning and sanitizing plan and the student COVID-19 response protocol.
number of staff members and members that we have. We are now at 85 of the 87, so we are too short of being fully staffed. But we also discussed utilizing our transportation department and some people that were interested in helping us there. We had 20 of the drivers that had actually said that they were interested. We set those up to go through our training program. Uh, as of today, we have 11 of the 20 that signed up that have gone through and completed. We assigned four of those that finished over the weekend uh, to schools on Monday. And we sent those to the schools that were short uh, on the allotment. So they have um, reported there. We had seven more that finished Monday and Tuesday, so they will be assigned tomorrow to go out to, to schools so we are working. Uh, and I believe before I walked in, they told me there was one more that was one module away from finishing, so that would give us the 12 out of uh, 20. We have some others that since we have started this uh, are coming forward to Mr. Harris and we're saying that they would like to also uh, be a part of this, so we are in the process of setting them up to also do uh, the cleaning. The machines that we talked about, the nebulous, uh, came in and all been assigned to schools. They all have them. The students have been trained on them. They are working with them and spraying the, the large areas, the hallways, uh, the commons areas, uh, gymnasium, the student restrooms going back through, uh, doing a, a san sanitizing of the building uh, at that point. Uh, we will also go back through to re-sanitize all classrooms. I uh, just can't do that during the day with uh, teachers there, but we will be going back and then working on that as well. We had the full training uh, that we talked about before, all custodians, and gave them the clean uh, standards that we have uh, and are working with them to uh, make sure that that's happening. Um, we're working on the area too with, with schools uh, on their individual plans of lunch and where they will have lunch. Some may still be able to use some in the cafeteria, but we're also doing uh, classroom. We're encouraging them to be outside in the courtyards, uh, utilizing the large spaces that they have for lunch so the students aren't confined in the classrooms for uh, all day, just coming out and getting lunch and going back. So, um, we have been working hard since then. We've also continued with the spray sanitizing bottles for the, the quad, the new quad, mid quad that we are utilizing. All teachers were issued uh, these bottles uh, at, when they returned uh, to carry over from what we had talked about uh, uh, when we closed in the two weeks in the anticipation of returning back in March. Uh, so all of that is still going on uh, as well. So we have, um, and I want to say this uh, for the record, I know that we have had uh, comments of, of teachers still having to clean the rooms. Um, Mr. Holmes, uh, I'm not aware of any of those. I've asked for teachers to uh, talk to administrators, and that's administrators to, to tell me specifically buildings that it's happening in, rooms that it's happening in, the types of things they're telling me they're having to do. Um, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that they may not have had to, or they may have not, not done something at some point in time. I'm not aware, and I, I need to be aware of specifics so that I can address those. Uh, just common statements, uh, I, I can't address those in a general, general setting. So, I would just ask that if, if someone does mention that, just please have them talk to the administrator and talk to the custodian that they're working with. Um, you know, I, I'm open to them contacting me as well. I, I just want to be able to handle and make sure that everyone is comfortable with what we're doing. Question. Who uh, yes, the cleaning events at students? That depends on which school and, and the custodians are responsible. I, I may have, just going through the list, and I have about 10 right now of 
teacher to take the next semester. And they're, they're cleaning their own classrooms, that there's still no sanitizing stations, the vents are not clean, the air doesn't work in half of the rooms. Uh, they allow anyone to come to the building when it was stated it would be limited. Visitors will definitely, that hasn't been the case. Here's a picture of the vent in my classroom. Here's a picture of the vent in the bathroom. Um, so I, and I know I've expressed the concerns of teachers. I've sat here in these meetings and expressed the concerns of teachers. So to say that you're not aware, I don't understand that, Mr. What I'm telling you is I'm not aware of teachers cleaning their own room. Are there areas in buildings that need to be cleaned? Absolutely. And I've been making walkthroughs to address those. Um, and when you say, when you say air's not working in half the rooms, I, what school are we talking about? What I rooms said, are we talking about? I said that to you yesterday. And I dealt with that. It's from that same school, Mr. Agent. The teacher just sent at, at 4.22 p.m. So, I mean, you can say that you're having to be dealing with it. A teacher sent you something at 4.22 a.m.? Yes, sir. 4.22 p.m. P.m., right here. Okay. It says what? It says what? And I have it. And I just went over it. Now, I'm going to send it to you again, but I thought yesterday it said that to you, your message that you got from was very detailed, which I greatly appreciate that it was happening, but then to hear it again today is totally opposite of what you told me in the text. Hearing that the air does not work or the cleaning. The one we talked about yesterday is the air did not work. Yes, time. Absolutely. And I gave you that detailed information. Maintenance was back out there and continue on that today. I checked before we came in and it has been completed. Is that the same thing that you gave me that text? Uh, no, this is a different one. Uh, this is just saying that, like I said, at 422 today. That was a message that was sent to me from that same school. Yeah, and um, the response was, uh, I even have to be concerned that I started asking, asking about the air that's working in the school when maintenance came to the building. The teacher asked if they were going to fix the air, and they said, no, you need to put in the work order. The teacher replied, I put in the work order on Monday. They said, well, keep calling and resend the work order. Several teachers have been complaining about having headaches when they leave at the end of the day, or chest pain, or since we re return back to school. Why are we having to clean our classrooms? And so, why the school has not been properly cleaned the vents in the classroom that have excessive amount of dust? Vents were only wiped out and not cleaned. So, I'm just at a loss of words because we all want our kids to go back to school. But in these conditions, I mean, this presentation is nice and it's good, but when people are reaching out and having these concerns, we just have to get them addressed. I don't know what we need to do to address them, but we have to address them with fidelity. We have to address them and not just that they're complaining, but really take their concerns seriously. I've never stood here and told you that people were just complaining. Okay. And if you take me that way. Oh, y'all can't talk at the same time. When you sent that to me yesterday, I checked into it, and they were working on it. It has been fixed. You're telling me about another one. I'm not aware of it until you sent it to me. Right. Once I'm aware of it, I will deal specifically with it, and that's my statement. I can't deal in generalizations. I need to know specifics. If I get a statement, half the rooms in the system's air don't work. I can't deal with that. I, I can't deal with it. And you know as well as I do that sometimes there are hyperbole, but I will deal with whatever specifically I'm aware of, and I will make sure that our maintenance departments deal specifically with what I'm aware of. But I can't, I can't deal with generalizations. And like I said, I appreciate whatever I reach out to you, that you always give detailed response. And I appreciate that. It's not as old. It'll be down as looking into we took care of it. You also provided me to responses. I appreciate that. And we'll continue to pass things on to you. It's just that I know you dealt with that yesterday, but at 422 today, I received another one from the same school, same issue. So I thought maybe 
if you took care of one classroom, the bottom is not protected at all. We check and we monitor the rooms. Unless we get something specific, we don't know. I mean, we can monitor, we, we can see that if a room is running hot, and we send someone to check those. We send, especially if they're running hot, we're not getting something saying, hey, my room is hot. Um, a lot of times what we find in that case is there's a lamp sitting on the thermostat that has the temperature run up so that the air runs 24 or 7. And, and we can't have that either because that damages the equipment. But if we get a stack or a work order from a school, we send makers to check those work orders. Now, I can also tell you that if we get a work order at 12 o'clock today, that it will be fixed by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Right? So, so but what I'm telling you is if I know specifics, and our makers department knows specifics, we will go out and deal with those specifics, but I can't do in general of, of my room is always hot or things. There's a lot of different things that can cause that. Uh, humidity after tomorrow, there will be some areas that will be warmer tomorrow because of the humidity after this rain. And we work with those kind of things as well. Some of those we just, it's something we have to deal with. Um, but again, I, I just go back to the specifics. If, if I have specifics from a school or from a teacher, we, we will deal with those specifics. But I can't, I can't fix generalities. And I'll continue to say them as I get them. Like I said from the beginning, I said what I said, that you said it was taken care of earlier. You gave me a deep explanation. However, the same thing was brought from a different teacher. So I thought maybe that would have been a question in the entire building. Hey teachers, whose rooms are, are becoming hot or, or whatever the question may be, so that if the person was already over there, they can go in and check. I understand a work order has to be put in and all that good stuff, but if a person's already over there, why can't it be checked for it or asked for every teacher in the building? If that was a problem. Um, I mean, looks like from the explanation that you gave me that it was a problem, but it was fixed. So you were trying to, both of you were trying to talk at the same time, and you said what you didn't say. Yes, sir. The problem yesterday was a truck. Mm-hmm. It was the today inside the building. Inside the building, yes. Which is a completely different issue. But it's still on the grounds of the school. We, it is, but we've got all these workers that we're trying to get. So we make those specifics. And we look into them and we have that. All right, so I'm going to send it to you when you check, when you check on it tomorrow to make sure this teacher's room is coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's what I like to know when we talk about clean room. The only thing I'm aware of, we teachers can have to do as far as clean, is take the spray bottle and spread out the surfaces and then leave that room. That's correct. That's all we've asked each time. I'd like to ask the teachers that are in here right now. Are they going to use the rooms? What do they do? I'd like to ask the teachers that are in here right now. Do you have to clean your room? Yeah. I, I do not like first house. I'm not going to in the room. And um, if we're talking in the room, do you think I know the first students who were back to school, uh, by four was shine, but the room was not clean. The same day, cockroach that was hanging on the web when I left in March was still hanging on that same web right behind my desk in August. The first two weeks I had to sweep by four every day because we were short of custodians. And I don't know why that wasn't known that we were short a custodian in August when he had questionable attendance in March. So I'm just speaking for power and whistle, but that's part of that connected education that I mentioned earlier. Yes, yes. Thank you. 
Well, how about this? How about after the text? How about we send a message to teachers and ask them what type of thing are they going to do? They're outside of the normal room. Because I don't know if you think I'm lying to you. I'm sure the teachers that are reaching out to me, that are reaching out to Ms. McDonald or any other board member, they're not lying to me. So maybe we need to do what we need to do, get with the people we need to get with, and work to send it all forward so that we can see what the needs are, who's not clean, who is clean, so that we can address those issues. Because I know for a fact that teachers are clean their own. So, and that's that on that. Continue with you. Okay. Um, I, I was wrapping up on the plea portion there um, to, to ask any questions. Um, we've had a discussion a little bit. Let's see if there were any other. Any additional questions for Mr. Dale? Mr. Agent, is Cameron Road Middle staffed properly for custodial help? I'm sorry? Is Cameron Road Middle staffed appropriately for custodial help? That's one of the schools that were short in custodial. We've sent two, uh, one of the um, transportation workers out uh, to begin helping there yesterday. So there's been an update with the list that you gave us maybe two weeks ago with the numbers of the custodians. There's been an update to that list? Yeah. Yes. That was, that was uh, in the intrusive report that they added to the report. Okay. So what I want to know is what else is needed? What do the custodians need in order to thoroughly, fully, to complete their job. What do they need thoroughly, fully, to fully complete their job? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to make a statement here because it seems we have one school that is... It's more than one school. They're just here to talk, to talk about it. It's more than one school that's here. And again, Ms. Brown, if I have specifics, I can more fully answer that question. So, how about tomorrow we send out the server to communicate to teachers with the schools so that you can not get generalizations, so that you can get specifics? Can we do that? Or I can go through and uh, look at my emails and look at other text messages and my Facebook messages, and I can send those to you as well. I'll be more than happy to send out to the staff. I, I've sent out to building administrators to ask them to speak with their teachers to see if there's anything specific because they handle their buildings. Uh, and I've asked that. I, I've gotten nothing as of now, this last week. I've gotten nothing where Anyone has sent me anything uh, to be addressed? I'm more than happy to send it to all teachers in GSA. So now we know that's an issue, but if it's one school, two school, three schools, or all 11, 12, 13, 18, whatever the case may be, now that we know that's an issue, can we address it so that it does not, it's not no longer an issue? Sure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Then I can ask you the answer to the question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just, I, I've been raising a pink card. Mm -hmm. Ms. Aiken, um, yes, as far as staffing, I, and I know it makes a difference in, in their work time and uh, the days that they're there. Uh, is everybody have like full time people that 
are there to clean up after the teachers leave, which is the case right now. Uh, how how is that set up? Is everybody that uh, are you, are you working with them? Are they are they are they there? And they, are they able to clean up after everyone leaves the building? Because I know there's some people that work after uh, you know everybody leaves the building. Yes, sir. How, how is that? Everyone that is part of that allotment is is full time. They're both part time custodial staff. Uh, we allow principals in the building to work to set times because some of them have different programs that go longer than others. So we allow them to work their custodial staff to set the times to have someone there before everyone gets there, have someone there after uh, everyone leaves, uh, if that's their desire. We have even, in the case of Calhoun Middle School, offered with the custodial staff any of them that would like to get additional time, uh, we would be more than happy to work with them to, to get overtime. Um, so we, we're working with the custodial staff to make sure that we're covered, uh, even if there's a short uh, fall. And we have, of the ones that were short, it was two high, before it was two high schools and the one middle school. Uh, but the high schools have, 11 and Spaulding High, um, and then Griffin, I believe that's 13, because uh, it's a little bit larger. Um, so we, we have worked to fill the ones with, that had the, I don't know if I want to say biggest need, but biggest impact. Uh, so we have, we have worked with that, but we have uh, all of the full-time restaurants, we have no part-time, and we, are, we allow the principals to work with their staff as far as time. Uh, yeah. well, I'm right. No, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you go, you go right there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Aiken, so let's say we have three transportation employees that come over to help Callan Road Middle, for example. Or do they have to quit at a certain time based on how we pay them? Or can they go finish their work, whether it takes their 30 minutes over, 40 minutes over? We've had the discussion with them. If, it, if they stay over for cleaning, we, we will allow it. We just need to discuss what, what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing it. But uh, the only thing we are uh, working around right now is on Tuesdays and Thursdays when all the transportation are out distributing meals. If they come in earlier today, yes, come in now. Aiken, Aiken, and I know yes, I know I, 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 and, and they do as well. And that's what I'm trying to say. I, but, I need to know. I need to know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So go ahead. Um, the only thing we have is that they have to feed. I have to stop by. I think right now it's like two o'clock in order to get to their bus to get to the schools to deliver uh, to deliver meals okay so if we go in person at some point and we will we'll and i've just got something running through my head right now that i'm going to explode however i think all of you in this room know that this board and i want the teachers and the parents that are here to know that the cleaning of these buildings is probably a very top priority. And it will continue to be my top priority other than taking care of our teachers. And it's pretty obvious. So if this occurs once we get back in school and we still need help from nutrition and or bus drivers with cleaning our buildings, will they be allowed to work and you might have to pay them overtime? That's the yes. question. Yes. The answer is yes. The problem that we've had all along is we've had this custodial allotment out there. And we've had a problem maintaining a full staff. Correct. Because the 85 we've got now are not the same 85 we had last week. Correct. 
we had the shortage about the same place it was last week. We worked very hard with two, with two agencies to augment our staff because we were not able to hire enough to be direct. We're working with bus drivers now who, who want to spend the time to be able to work during this time the driving is not an everyday thing. We understand that when we go back to the in-school option, they're driving more in the afternoon. There's going to be a limitation either during the middle of the day or afterwards to get this done. That's part of our scheduling. That's part of the scheduling challenge that we have. And we want this to work. And we know we've got to go to those limits to make it work. So if we still got issues out there, we'd be glad to do the survey that we talked about to see who's being asked to do what. We've talked to principals about what do they need they don't have. We've made allowances and allotments and deliveries on those things. We've been to check closets and found things that were, were delivered or were put out of the way. To make sure that all of those things are back out where they're supposed to be, we change out the types of supplies that some like or some do not like, some prefer different things. We try to make those accommodations. And that's what we can still do. We know that we've got that during the, this next seven weeks if you will allow this plan to move forward, which talks to the October return. That schedule is going to be how we're going to have to do it. And we know that's going to be happening. Well, I'll be quite honest with you and, and everyone in this room, when, when, when Ms. Duke and Ms. Johnson say that they haven't gotten anything that they were supposed to get, I kind of have reservations. And I don't know why they don't have the stuff they were told they would get. They would get. That's the same thing that was asked a long time ago. They said, oh, every school has got it. I know I said it. Oh, they got it. They got it. They got it. When I did got a message, they said they didn't have it. So, I mean, I'm not placing blame on anyone. I'm just trying to understand how this continues just to be a, I just don't get it. And if you don't know, just say that you don't know. That's, if you don't know if it's been done or completed, just say that you don't know that you look into it. Don't be so sure that it's been done and it's not when people are reaching out to board members saying that these things have not been done. Just tell the truth. And I'm not, not saying that you're lying or anything. Wait, Mr. Smith. Yeah, yeah, not I'm calling you a lie. What I'm saying is just tell us the truth so that we know that it's being done. I can always say, you know what, I'll look into it, I'll check into it. But then when you tell them that it's been done and I tell them that it's been done, it's like, so you don't believe me? So if, it, if you're not sure about it, just say that you don't know. Like when I asked about the hand sanitizer being delivered, you said it was delivered a week ago. But that wasn't the case. The hand sanitizer was still sitting there whatever the shop it was. And I, so just tell the truth. If you're not aware of it, say that you're not aware of it, but you'll look into it. Don't tell me that it's been done. Don't tell my colleagues that it's been done and it has not been done because we get a different report. That's all I'm saying. And I want to make sure that we do everything in a swift and smooth way so that when it's time to vote to reopen these schools, we can reopen these schools and our children and our teachers and our families will be safe. That's it. If you don't know, say you don't know. I uh, like I said, dude, I've never stood here and lied to you about any piece of I understand. So I don't want to call you a lie. That's what I say. I was very clear what I say. That's what you said. I'm talking to both of y'all. But you can't talk to both of us at the same time. Y'all are trying to talk to me at the same time. I know. But I'm not, and that's what I'm saying. I always appreciate you, Mr. A. Game, in providing you detail into everything I've ever asked you about. And so that's all I can take you at your word because that's what you've done. But just know that there are teachers that oh, geez, uh, just let me know that there are teachers that have concerns about their rooms not being clean. I just got five messages to send up here right now. So let us do the survey. Teachers be honest in your survey. Let us do the survey so that we can see what the needs are what's not being clean and how they feel so we can fix it and move on Mr. Brown, do you know if they're going to their administrators also? Um, I always say go to your administrator. They tell me they follow the chain of command. So, if they say they are, they are. I'm not trying to throw everybody the bus, but maybe there's something else that, that central office can do on a great scale to, so that things are taken care of.
siblings of the said magistrate will have to remain quarantined at home with their sibling uh, through the 14 day period. And um, they return after that if they are not exhibiting any symptoms of their own. So the notice we have there, uh, sometimes we get a negative diagnosis, but the student, the, the healthcare provider, may say that the student still needs to remain at home for seven days and we follow those uh, directions of that student. And then we'll continue there. If multiple students in the same class exhibit symptoms, at that point in time, we would look at sending the entire class home uh, until a diagnosis is obtained. Um, students who were sent home uh, while waiting will be allowed to complete work and distance learning. Uh, and at any time, if we reach 50% uh, of students being sent home, not uh, students diagnosed, uh, we will close the school for 72 hours. Do the first 24 just to isolate the school, and then we will take the next 48 hours to clean and sanitize the building before we're allowing the students back in the building. So that is the updated student program. What about the teacher profile? Uh, that would, Ms. Dobbins, uh, that's part of oh, the presentation. But it, it correlates with with the student. Mm -hmm. No. Well, if she can I ask her a question in regards to yes. All right. and we can show it to the Right. Okay. So, one second. Can we turn the lights on just to turn on? Okay. So, this came from two different employees of immigration. Quick summary. Until 4.30 p.m., so our HR department is not allowing people to tell any if they have tested, if they tested positive for COVID-19. We have been so busy that it's something that I hadn't looked into until recently when my coworker, with a teacher like myself, who goes to several locations and makes contact with at least 40 people and even parents and kids had a family member who tested positive. The staff member at HR said because that the employee had a basement and two air units, she would be fine. Mind you, this employee, and she gave the employee's title. To me, that's like calling the hospital and telling you have chest pains, and they say, oh, take an advent, you'll be fine. The plot thickens, trust me. Let's just say my kids will not be returning to GSCS, and it's not because of COVID-19. So with this, that I just got this quick summary and about reporting COVID-19, how are we ensuring our teachers? And yes, we did take the extra step to report weekly the COVID cases, or lack thereof, or whatever. So we greatly appreciate that. So how can we know that HR is going to completely address these issues and not tell somebody that you've got a basement and an air unit so you'll be fine. Just come on and work. I would like to stay with you after this meeting because I'm sorry that is not accurate. So you're aware of it? No, I'm not, but that is not something that anybody in my department would say. So I would be glad to meet with you. So we have a protocol that we follow consistently. Mr. Chair, but instead of saying well, I am not aware, you can't get up here and say that that didn't happen. So give the benefit of the doubt that we will look into it. Don't stand up here and say that it didn't happen because you went there when it was said you went on phone. I'm sorry, but you know, I'm, in this meeting, I felt like all that has happened this entire evening is that accused, 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 and everybody here is working very diligently to do the right thing. And I'm glad that we all working hard to do it. However, I have questions and concerns that you bring to me, and that's all I can do is address them. Thank you, Ms. Adams. We have consistently used the same protocol when people have identified themselves as having symptoms of COVID. They've been screened, they've been asked to go home. We've used a, a contact tracing piece that we can do here, report that in the health department, we've got positive cases, they're sent home, we use the contact trace here, the health department handling more of them. 
but we can't tell people that their pilot has tested positive for COVID. We can't tell them that. We can't tell those who we end up telling, you may have been exposed and you need to go home. We can't tell them who they're exposed because of the HIPAA requirements. But they have done that consistently. Well, I'm not aware of a case where it wasn't done. If you'd like to bring one to my attention, I'll be glad to look at it. But I'm not aware of that. I know we've had many of these. Because those numbers have been confirmed. Right now, we happen to have a very few, a much lower number of those who have still got active cases. Because they come off, they come off of those lists. Well, we've worked very hard to work with the health department on those protocols. Mr. Brown, is there a reason that you had brought that to the before? No, it was just an FTS uh, two days ago. So two days ago, you got this answer, and we don't know about it. And I follow up a phone call with that person today to talk with them. Because I've scheduled a call with them before bringing it to your attention. And I bring it to your attention. But they should have brought our attention directly. This is what they're getting. They're not following the chapter. That, 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 that's not happening. And we've talked about this time after time again. What we can do as a system so that people will follow the chain of command. And as I told that employee, this is something that you need to go to your principal about, or you need to make an appointment with Ms. Dobbins or Ms. Aiken so that you can talk about this issue. But everybody, again, is so scared to do that. And I am going to do my due diligence and bring these issues to everybody's attention. You can't fault me for it. I'm going to bring it to your attention. I don't mind being brought to our attention. There's got to be a change where people feel so empowered to just go right past their principal, right past the central office, and go straight to the right. So let me ask you this. I've said that before. And we've been dealing with that since March. And what has what have you done as superintendent and single office done? We res yes, go ahead. We respond to those issues that are brought to our attention. Right. But what are we doing as we talk about functional economy? You know, I'm really looking to read this book that Mr. Hugh gave me, How the Culture and Kingdom. And I think maybe our school students get the benefit from that as well. So, like I said, we brought it to your attention. We know that teachers, employees feel uncomfortable going to their administrators. They feel uncomfortable reaching out to central office staff, but they do feel comfortable reaching out to board members who they feel are standing up and looking out for them. I'm sorry that they're coming. Well, I'm not sorry that they're coming to me. I'll continue to bring it to your attention. Maybe it should have been brought to your attention at this meeting right now. Maybe I should have pulled you aside and said something. But again, it goes to the, to, to, to the point of we have to do something in our district. Maybe this is a big project that you can work on on your way out, of making sure that we bring people to the table and that we fix the climate and culture so that people are not afraid to bring things to their attention. That's why I brought up some weeks ago about the whistleblower policy. Hopefully. Y'all put it on the agenda so we can talk about it and start looking at it. Because this will help our district. At the end of the day, you and I want the same thing, Mr. Smith, for this district to run smoothly, for people to be happy and comfortable as teachers and scholars and going to families and doing their experience, education experience and from that school. But unfortunately, there are things that happen that prevent that. And maybe it's not a large scale thing it, feeling everybody feeling that way, but the fact that there is a, um, a, a small group that feel that way, we still have to address it. So all the thing I can do is to bring it to you, bring it to my colleagues, and then we figure out how we're going to address it. And I think that's very good. I think we need to continue to move on those with the, where we're at within the agenda. Mr. Chair, can I just ask one question again? Sure. I'm just trying to move it along because I, I heard, we heard what you said. Yes. This, this, uh, you know, I've seen the contact tracing app. Is, is that something that you use? Because and I, and I, have, I don't use one. I haven't seen one. 
does that does that tell who they've been in contact with, or how does that work? Okay, I, you know, and I'm, I'm quite familiar with the confidentiality department, but I was just wondering, with those uh, contact tracer apps, do they give a name of uh, who they may have been exposed by? Okay. To my knowledge, no. Um, you know, sometimes the individual will also have a name that they have been One quick question about COVID reporting. I was contacted by an IT person, a traveling IT person, and we all know that they go into several schools and, and come in contact with several people. The question to me was, they go into these schools not knowing what the COVID climate is, if you will, how many cases, what am I facing? And then this particular employee asked about a certain, uh, another employee in the building, and um, it was just like everybody froze. And they just, they wouldn't say anything. I, my point is this, I believe our employees might be confused about basically what you just said to us. What can and can't be stated, but in my meeting with Mr. Smith last week, I still feel like if we're going to bring employees back, students back, and parents have to make decisions, I think parents, I think if all those entities deserve to know the climate of a certain building. You know, if we have a big outbreak at Griffin High School, that's really going to change things. But if we only have the one isolated case at Callan Road Middle, and then that's, we can party all night long, you know? But I, I think this employee that contacted me deserves to know what he or she might be walking into in that particular building. But I, I think, and we did address this yesterday in my communicator message, actually. And we did put that out and talk about that. The issue really is this. When we get these numbers, get these reports, the people are asked to stay home. So when you walk into a building that may have had two or three cases, those people aren't there. The people who may have been exposed for the first level who need to be asked to go quarantine to see if they can, they aren't there either. And I want to make sure as we do the report that people don't misunderstand that you're not walking into a building that has, that has no active cases. Just like you wouldn't know when you walk into Walmart or a restaurant or any place else. It's out of the community. But as we get these reports, as we as people do the reporting, as they get the testing and do that, we're following the protocol. So if we did, we did put out a list that said Griffin Eyes had five cases since June, those five are in the building after it is known that they had. 
Now, I want people to understand that. So you talk about going from building to building, it's not a, it's not a, I don't think it's a culture of the building is going to create more cases. That you walk into a building and you think this is an unsafe building. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the proper understanding of it. And maybe the people who worked in there well, I got exposed somewhere, but then they're important and handled according to the protocol. So I want to be sure it's, it's understood correctly. Well, I just, I just think, based on my conversation, is that maybe our employees are, are just need clarification. Um, what? I mean, I, I, I get it, but, but based on the response of this employee that contacted me. I know that uh, Mr. Pugh is going to post weekly our updated numbers, and so that came out to the first time last week. Right. I hope that will help, um, but we really have not had high numbers at all. Thank you. Okay. We're able to continue. Good. Unless you have additional questions. Okay, that's everything as far as I'm Dr. Okay. 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 That's all I understand. that's the, the, the substance that we use. I have great empathy 
for everybody in this school system. I love this school system. It, I'm a product of this school system. So I think we all agree we're on the same team. We all love this school system. I'm thankful for that. Um, and uh, so I won't share with you these quotes, uh, but our goal is to empower students to graduate college and career ready. I think as many times as we can say that, uh, we're better off. I, you know, I have great empathy for the teachers. My mom taught this school system for 33 years. Uh, so, we, you know, I got big love for everybody. All parents, you're going through a tough time. Um, so here's, here's my findings. Uh, this, this video will be those findings. But here's a couple of quotes uh, that I've learned just in the last few days. Um, Nicole with the Department of uh, Public Health, DPH, District 4, she said, I think your plan is very well thought out. I like the new Nagel machine. It will be a great help. I feel like you've covered all your bases here, and this plan will be put into action. Uh, Ashton Harris at the state level with the DPH. She said, your plan is more detailed and more in-depth than many plans that we've seen. Uh, Clinton Westbrook, uh, Anthony walked through schools. I walked through as well, because that was one of the days that I was building and talking to principals and talking to teachers. Uh, and I know that they inspected some schools. Um, and one of those was the school that, that's been brought up. And I know that that school has been going through a leadership change. I know they've been without a principal for a while. And that's like a ship without a captain. And that's a challenging scenario. So I've got empathy for all teachers at Cal Middle. Um, but we went through schools. And Clinton Westbrook said, he's the school safety coordinator for GMO, which is Georgia Emergency Management uh, and Homeland Security Agency. Uh, but Clinton Westbrook said, your school safety plans cover everything that the law requires and more. It was written with guidance from the CDC. We couldn't ask for more than that. You're doing a great job. Um, Glenn Bolt, uh, he's got a bunch of titles. He's Spalding County Deputy Fire Chief, EMA Director, and the Director of uh, Spalding County's Homeland Security. He said, Griffin Spalding County School System is proactive and has worked tirelessly to create the best and most comprehensive safety and security plans. We got experts saying that. But there's also data that things aren't perfect. Uh, and that's where I've come in. I'm here to help with communication. Um, the story that I referenced, I went to Calhoun Road Middle School, and I was filming people, and my question to them was, tell me how you feel about the prospect of students coming back at some point. Not tomorrow, but starting the process of students coming back. I said, I'm not going to give you a script. Tell me in your own words your thoughts about them coming back. And you guys will see that. And because, Mr. Holmes, I heard you say at the last meeting two weeks ago, I want to hear it from every principal's mouth. So I wanted to give you guys that. I wanted to give you the communication that you need. Um, and so when, when I went, they said, I can't say anything positive in regards to students coming back because we don't have all we need. And I said, please tell me. I talked to their administrators. I said, please tell me everything that will make you feel better about students coming back. They told me, I took the notes in my phone, I came straight to Anthony Aikens. In the next two days, he had delivered or virtually delivered himself every single thing and more that they asked for. Say that again. Say that again. Anthony did what? Tuesday, I went to Calgary and Middle. Tuesday evening, I gave that to Anthony. Wednesday and Thursday, all the needed items were delivered. He did a lot of that himself. He even, they, they, their teachers were not happy with the little uh, bottles with the nozzle that you shake the hand sanitizer in your hand. They preferred the pumps. So we swapped out every bottle in every classroom and gave them the pumps. Um, they also didn't like the hand sanitizer dispensers that you push because you have to touch it and get the sanitizer come out. And don't misunderstand, I'm not calling them complaining. It's their preference. So he took the automatic ones that you don't have to touch. We're here to serve. My job as a communicator is to hear problems and solve problems, to find data that, that provides solutions. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I know this is a tense time. I know there's a ton of emotion. I do know these people care, and, and we want help. And, and so the communication is part of the gap. If we can get the data to the people that can fix it, I promise you we will. I'm not the hand sanitizer man, but I have a car, and I'll deliver sanitizer if it's needed. Okay, so we're a team, all this together. Um, so we, I went back on Thursday. They gave me a sound bite. They said, yeah, we have everything we asked for. 
Yeah, so that was progress, and that's what we need to do. And we need to build trust because people don't trust because of whatever reason. There's a number of those variables. But every time they tell us and we deliver, that'll build trust and that'll build that culture that you reference and tell. So we, we're all in the same boat. We, have to, we all got to row the same direction. And uh, I hope this video will help show you guys some of the things that are in place, uh, that are open. I saw nebula machines at least four schools that were working. I didn't stage that. They were working. They were, they were using them. Uh, so let's watch the video together. Thank you so much for letting me come and show this. Uh, and I hope it makes you as excited as it made me uh, working on it in the evening and over the weekend because uh, I was really fired up to show this to everybody. Imagine the difference of the trying to switch this from students, parents, and community. With the flexibility of pensions that have navigated this COVID 19 pandemic together. We're excited now to be able to offer a choice of returning to in-school, brick and mortar classroom learning, or remote at home learning using Google Classroom. We're committed to providing a quality educational experience while maintaining safety. Safety is paramount. Since April, we have been working and planning with various local regulatory agencies and safety experts concerning our plan. We work with the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, local fire departments, governor's office, the Georgia Department of Education, the Georgia Department of Public Health, and the local health department to review our plans and make recommendations to improve those. We will continue to stay in contact with these agencies and use the information and resources they provide to mitigate risk and to strive for maximum safety. We are excitedly preparing to welcome our students back into our schools. There have been many adjustments, revisions, updated plans, and new safety measures. We're returning to our option one plan from this summer. At that time, 57% of our students indicated that they would be returning back to in-person instruction. We'll soon ask you to take another survey, but first we want to explain your options and share highlights of all the measures we've taken to create a safe in-person learning environment. The remote learning option will remain the same. Students could potentially hire a new teacher as class rosters may be adjusted. Some teachers will focus on in-person learning, and others will be dedicated to virtual education using Google Classroom. The same Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots will be utilized. Lunch delivery by bus will be discontinued, but meal pickup at the school will still be available for virtual learning students. Virtual students may choose to participate in extracurricular activities. What will the in-person educational experience look like? Students will wear masks on the bus, in common areas, and when they are able to socially distance. Face coverings are part of the dress code. Social distancing will be an important part of our plan to return to in-person school. Students will have assigned seats in their classroom to help with social distancing and contact tracing. School nutrition staff members will continue to follow service day practices wearing gloves face covering, and other UPE. Lunch will be picked up by students and taken to their classroom where students may remain in their assigned seats and social distancing may be maintained. Plastic utensils will be used and food will be packaged for transport. Many students will be in their classrooms. However, students have flexibility and they use courtyards, common areas like the cafeteria, or other large spacious rooms. Social distancing will be maintained. Temperatures will be kept at the table. Teachers and staff have been self screening daily since their return, and no one has registered to be yet. Our staff have a consistent protocol to follow that is approved by CDC and EPH. Visitors to schools will check in at the front office, and a designated staff member with personal protective gear will take their temperature with a new brand of vegetables tomorrow and ask the screening questions to be locked. Each student will be temperature screened in our outlets too. Infrared touchless thermometers may be used, and we are investing in new thermal cameras that will soon be installed in all schools. 
The campus detects and shows high temperatures of individuals instantly. The temperatures are displayed on a monitor as groups of students pass by. Well, the transportation does not provide a place to social distance. For this reason, the driver and students will wear face coverings while on the bus. Additionally, hand sanitizer will be given to all students as they enter the bus. Buses will be loaded in a bag moving forward to minimize contact. After dropping students off, bus drivers will set aside the services on the buses. As an additional safety measure, the bus seat will be pre-treated to make them resistant to germs, viruses, bacteria, and more. School media centers will serve students in a different way when they return. Book carts will be taken to the classroom for students to check out books, but also students will use the program Destiny Discover to place holds on books, and those books will also be delivered to the classroom. Many skills may be taught in the classroom or via the Google Classroom. This is the challenge of mind when some students may have social or emotional needs. All counseling and social services will be available for in-person and online students. Another component of the safety plan is personal hand sanitizer. Students are encouraged to wash their hands often. They'll be given ample opportunity to wash their hands and use hand sanitizer throughout the day. All classrooms have hand sanitizers in common areas and all schools have new hand sanitizer dispensers. If a student has positive for COVID-19, those who have met the definition of close contact will quarantine for 14 days. Close contact is defined by being within six feet of an infected person for more than 15 minutes. This is why students will have consistent assigned seating. If a student tests positive, only the students seated within six feet of them will be quarantined. Only if multiple students in the same classroom test positive will the entire class be quarantined. While in quarantine, students will return to virtual schools via Google Classroom. Now I'm happy to share some details that I'm sure will be of interest to many. We currently have 84 of 87 aligned custodial positions filled, and we have 20 bus drivers who are in custodial training. We also have one temporary employee that will be coming on, so we will have 85 of our 87. Training includes chemical handling and equipment operation. These bus drivers will add additional manpower during the middle of the day and serve as subs when needed. Residents will be cleaned at least three times a day. Common areas will be frequently cleaned and disinfected by traditional methods. Also, new equipment will be used to sanitize common areas regularly in all classrooms at least once a week. A power flight and nebula disinfecting minister like this one has been purchased for your school. As you can see, this machine makes sanitizing quick and efficient. We thought you might like to hear a teacher's perspective and hear from the principals of each building about how they feel in regards to having students back in their school building. Hi parents and students, it's Ms. Freeman. Um, I just wanted to take the time to let you guys know that I absolutely love virtual learning. Um, it definitely has been an adjustment and learning curve, but we cannot wait to have students back in person to continue the learning process. As teachers, we've been asked to sanitize desks and all surfaces to minimize the risk of COVID, leave all the other cleaning up to the custodians. We planned, we prepared, and I think we are ready to go. We are preparing right now really hard for kids to return back to school. We have a great safety plan in place, and we're excited about seeing our scholars back in our building. We have received all the PPE. We're confident that our building is safe, and we have everything we need to get them here and keep them safe. I think we can't wait to have our students back in the building. We're ready to go at Beaverbrook, and we are so excited about seeing the kids come back to school. We're ready. We can't wait to have the students back in our building. We are excited that we're hoping for about the things we have in place to prepare for our students to come back. I think we have been working diligently to prepare for your safe return, and we cannot wait to see you. Parents, safety is a priority. We have a great plan for students coming back to our building. Students, we love you and we miss you. We are so excited to be taking steps to welcome our eagles back to the nest. Or the elementary teachers are prepared for our students to return to the building. We can't wait for you to return. It's just not the same without you here. 
you and Ben Shop students very much. And we are excited about the possibility of their, their returning. And we are excited about being a kid last year at Griffin High School to continue the education process face to face. We have everything we need. It's all in place to help minimize risk. We can't wait to see the children back here at school. We are so looking forward to the students coming back to school in Griffin's Walmart County Schools. Can't wait to see you come. We actually have students in our building since May. We've followed the protocol of the CDC, the Department of Public Health, Southern Mass and Technical College, as well as Griffin's Walmart County School System. Students would sign in daily. We would take their temperature. They would know if they had been exposed to anybody with COVID, as well as if they were exhibiting any symptoms of COVID. We currently have hand sanitizers, lemon cloth in every classroom, and they're being used. We have the big warm sanitizers. All students, faculty, and staff have been great about wearing their masks. We'll be reporting COVID-19 numbers within the school system each Thursday. We'll provide these numbers to local media and post the report on our social media and our website. There's no magic number or specific threshold that when reached will mandate a return to all virtual education. We will, however, continue to work weekly with the Department of Public Health, GPA, local fire departments, Department of Education, CDC, and the Governor's Office, and we'll follow their guidance. We're committed to safety. Every student, parent, teacher, and staff member is important to us. Together we are 9,736 students, 5,421 families, 1,496 staff members, and 20 schools. But we're one team. Please help us continue to show courtesy and respect and all encouragement to work together. Remember to wear your mask. Practice social distancing. Wash and sanitize your hands often. We'll administer temperature checks. We implement additional cleaning procedures. And we'll work with government agencies to help experts. Please stay safe, influence, and opportunity. Together, we are working great, small and strong, and committed to safety. Of that information that brings us to the proposed recommendation 
uh, from the Startup School Task Force. Uh, and we are recommending that we implement in person in two phases. The first phase will be targeted special education students for September 28th. And the second phase will be all other students starting on Monday, October 19th to attend in person. We will continue to offer remote learning for students who would like to continue with remote learning format. At this time, I would like to ask uh, Charles Kelly, the Social Education Director, to come forward to explain the reintegration plan, which is a part of the first phase of the recommendation for our Special Education students.
to uh, page 11 of the plan, I had, I had made a notation. And, and I, I shared with Mr. Smith about my concern about personnel that may need to uh, provide services in uh, stupid homes. And I think Mr. Smith told me that, uh, it was a limited number if I'm correct. But I was I was willing to know uh, what type of PPE with these people because it says that uh, the department has provided personal PPE equipment to address more risk to service providers who may go into homes. Uh, what are we going to do actually to try to make sure those people feel comfortable going and visiting homes that they, they have no idea of what's going on, just like we, we talked about earlier. Uh, IT people going to school don't really know what's going on. So what 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 type of uh, PPE uh, are we going to equip them with? And, and uh, how often, if, 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 just, I know you may not have an exact number, how often do you think that's going to occur when they have to go and visit students' homes? So currently we don't have uh, we do not have plans to go into homes to provide services. There was some conversation initially about uh, that potential, um, but we moved into the virtual phase, so we're not currently doing that. Uh, we do have staff members that are coming into closer contact with students, like psychologists that do evaluations. Um, we provided them with masks, with uh, gloves, with face shields, and we have partitions as well, so they have a, a plexiglass partition in between them and the students because they are they're, they're testing students for an extended period of time for the evaluation. So um, all those precautions are in place there for, for that. And it's a limited amount of students that come in at a time. Okay. Thank you. Knowing that you may have at least some potential hospital homebound. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, what all, you that's really yeah. all that you yeah. got. So you've got those same types of uh, uh, PPE that would be available to them. Okay. But it's very limited. Right. Thank you. Thank is approved by the Board of Education will launch the GSCS learning model selection form that is pictured if you go to the next slide. An example of that is pictured here. If this approved uh, this evening, the form will go out tomorrow morning. We did indicate in the timeline that uh, parents and guards would have 10 days to respond. Uh, and, uh, to the survey, and then there will be follow-up contact uh, with uh, parents because we will uh, want to have a, a response from every single family. Uh, the form, if it is launched tomorrow, we will post on Friday, September 11th, which will be the 10-day period. All parents and guards will need to complete the form to select either in-person learning or remote learning for the remainder of first semester. Once this election is made, students will remain in their selected model through the end of first semester that concludes on December 18th. Next slide. Any questions? Any questions? I know I think I've spoken to several people about an idea that was presented to me and I've had it myself. Would there, could we also perhaps not only bring SPED back on the 28th, but I know some of the horror stories I hear about pre-KK and one trying to sign in and log in. Um, I know as a former educator, I know that those pre-KK and one getting them to go in the right direction in the hallway and not go down a certain, you know, the protocols that they have to learn are, are it takes so long for them to get into the routine of school. Could we perhaps maybe consider pre-KK and one coming back 
with SPED. I know that's been presented to me by uh, some administrators in, in the county. I think it would be a really good dry run, so to speak. We did talk at length. Um, there was uh, over a two-day period actually about the phase in uh, a lot of discussion around phasing in students that and some of the options that we did discuss, Ms. McDonald was uh, looking at the lower grades. We also talked about some transition grades, uh, sixth, ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of discussion around that topic. Uh, I also, uh, in reference to uh, what the recommendation uh, of the task force after that conversation, this is where we landed with the session uh, target population you know, with our sexual education students and then all other students coming on October 19th. I did personally call every principal and, and speak with them about the recommendation that was coming forth prior to us bringing it because I wanted to make sure uh, that we had missed anything and that we made sure that we got their feedback as to what they thought uh, and in reference to what the task force had uh, decided to bring forward. And with that, um, the principals out of that conversation um, all agreed in reference to October 19th uh, that looking at the seven week timeline, they felt like that would give enough time for them to be ready for all students. Uh, there also were conversations about uh, being able to have their small population uh, with the special education student rules would allow them to uh, focus on that group of students and look at any other possible needs that they may need to prepare for in year before October 19. We also had discussions around in the task force uh, using our October 9th, uh, which is a district professional learning day currently on the calendar. Uh, we're looking at ways to, uh, we know we have some contract services that we have already uh, lined up for that day, but we're looking to try to remove all other non-contracted services off that day to allow that day to be more of a planning day for teachers to prepare uh, before the break to receive students on October 19th after the break. Okay, that's, if you contacted everyone, uh, I'll applaud you for doing that. Thank you. Any other questions for them? I have a quick question. If it, originally, we had at least 43% that wanted to be virtual. Yes. Uh, Obviously, we're going to send this survey out, and they're going to have to make a decision again. Is there a certain percentage that we need to achieve to feel as though we can get to back to, you know, is there a percentage there that if they decide to go bring, like, if we had 80% and want to go back to brick and mortar that's done with something, you know, virtual learning, is there a number for that, or are we prepared to go with whatever we have? We were prepared to report with what that percentage is that comes in. We did have conversations around uh, the possibility of there being uh, an increase uh, in that 43 percent. So we did discuss that as well. Uh, but we are prepared to move forward with the in-person uh, option, uh, and we are going to plan on the house even when we certainly close us at the 10 days that students would uh, make contact with anyone who has a responder because we will need to have a response from each family. Have you discussed a decrease? As far as a targeted decrease, uh, in that conversation, we did not believe that we would have less. I think more of the conversation, I know there are a few people in here that are on the task force and was uh, thinking that there would possibly be an increase. I mean, uh, you know, with the, with the change in, in data, I think it would have been proven because, uh, you know, you started out, kids wouldn't uh, be at a high rate of contracting COVID. And if we've seen schools open up, turn around around and close, and, and people have had a change in mind. Matter of fact, I'm just reading, reading uh, something from someone that said all about the email, uh, you know, and I think it was a teacher. Uh, 
think it was a teacher, and you know, they they, they uh, were not in favor of uh, returning back to class. And I think they really, I think what we've seen through uh, some emails, at least I think some people have had a change in heart because they they've seen the numbers uh, go up in schools that have actually started in school and ended up having to uh, close down and, uh, because of the, uh, the numbers that they had. So I, I think it would have been prudent for you all to look at both, both scenarios because you really don't, you really won't know until you do the survey. So, so why not be reactive instead of being proactive? So I think, I think that conversation should have been should have been had because nothing is concrete. Uh, we should be we should be prepared for either either option. You know, I'm like Miss Sue. If it did go up, how would we be able to respond as far as social distancing? If they did, uh, we did have more people to want to do in school. How are we going to respond? But then, how are we going to how are you going to respond if you have, uh, I guess we already doing it because everybody is doing virtual mm -hmm. uh, remote learning. So that wouldn't be a hard adjustment, but uh, uh, I think the people that returning back to school, is, is, if we have more than we probably expect from the first survey, uh, that, that's going to that's gonna, you know, kind of adjust the plan a little bit. Because we don't, we're not going to be able to do social distancing uh, as the plan is presented. So uh, I'm glad you all did look at that. But uh, you know, we, we should always look at both sides of the coin for future reference. Well, and I'm just saying, it's not necessary to understand how uh, what our thoughts were is that we would we thought that we would have more of an increase if we have a decrease. We are already currently in remote learning. Right. So there's that, and then we also will be able to socially distance even more. So we didn't foresee that that would be a main issue because we already are in a current operational plan with remote learning. Uh, but if we have an increase, and that's why uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, it was important to note that the things that we had to focus on or mitigation strategies, because it's not and, and, and it's not if a situation is going to happen this when, right. and we can see that just from what has happened with every uh, system that has uh, ventured into the in-person uh, learning situation and environment. So our focus is on social distancing. If we cannot maintain social distancing, we have to have uh, face covers, which is something that uh, several districts did not require if you look at the patterns to what has occurred in multiple school systems that have gone into an in-person environment. They strongly encouraged, but they did not require it. If you can't have social distancing, you have to have face covers. That's a mitigation strategy the cleaning, the hygiene, the monitoring of systems, and making sure we have the COVID response protocol in place. That's what our focus has to be on, regardless of how many numbers of students come in for any person learning. Yes. But I just want to be sure I understand that this, and what you presented this evening, masks are required. Yes. Okay. I want to be sure. That is correct. That was one of our mitigation strategies that we felt it was uh, imperative that we included in the plan. Okay. Very yes, ma'am. Thank you. There are also, just to make it clear, if you do adopt this tonight, there are two additional action items that follow this. One of those is a is a amendment to the dress code policy that would allow ministry to require masks. We need that cover for the data. The second one has to do with the thermal cameras that you saw in the video, but we need approval to purchase those, put those in place. Because all those two pieces sitting out there. I also
off of that, it was Dr. Kennedy said about, uh, we, we did look at the idea of we were going to have more people coming to the building, less or whatever. But it also falls into our staffing uh, strategy as well. Because there may have to be some creative ways to staff and work to free up positions depending on how those numbers fall. So there are a lot of things we can do to try to help, help mitigate even the staffing, even the staffing tests. And that was a lot of discussion around that is why we see a flexible staffing model that we uh, decided upon. I know that um, some of the discussion I have with my fellow board members is not so much the plan, you know, the plan seems to be good, it's the implementation of that plan and how that works. And so I know that um, even before we go any farther with this, that we have two more board more meetings coming up. One's going to be on the 15th, one in October. Uh, that we discussed the possibility of being able to see a school in person prior to maybe a board meeting to be able to see some of those things in place and the importance to bring the confidence level that, you know, the plan that we have is great, but we want to continue to see that in person too. And I think that, that would be important. Mm -hmm. Anything else, board members? We have a recommendation then. Well, hold on. I, it, I just want to ask, is this the time? For us to discuss and ask questions uh, are we about the plan. Well, I mean, if you if it's about the plan, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did have a couple that I wanted to ask about, and I apologize. I, I have to go back and look in the pages. I got to highlight it and uh, make sure they all got answered. And uh, thank you to. Uh,
I've, 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 I've heard some others since the mom. Have done that, and you feel more about it. Have we, have we looked into that or considered that? Yes, sir. We're, we're continuing to look into it now. Um, one of the brands that we looked at with a lot of our water fountains in, well, we have to consider is we have different brands of water fountains, so we have to try to look. Uh, one continuous called the LK, UK, we have uh, a good number of those throughout the system, and that's the one that we have. Are looking uh, at to possibly retrofit over those. I can't say for sure, Mr. Holmes, it is a touch list, but it is a one touch. It's yeah. easy to push with the elbow or. Field station, right? Yeah, field yeah, station. Field station. Yeah. Possibly retrofit. All right. Um, I think that's, that's it, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to make sure. On the same page, Dr. Taylor, page 21, about transportation, the second bullet is buses will be cleaned and disinfected daily. I would hope they would be disinfected after the AM run and then again after the PM run. That's correct. Okay. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. That is spelled out somewhere else. I think it's in the uh, claiming as But it's, it's oh, I know where it's at. I have too many documents with us. It is actually on our meeting our um, COVID 19 prevention strategies and practices on this document for transportation. Bus clean disinfected daily out of one and dismissal rides. Person, uh, then we would have to reassign those students to an in-person teacher. And, and uh, Dr. Kennedy, so how are we going to go about? Uh, how are we going to survey the students, the parents, and students about whether their preference, you know, in school uh, virtually? Are we are we uh, surveying the teachers as well? Uh, how are we doing that? Uh, one thing that has uh, been um, when we've gathered uh, teachers' feedback around the skills assessment um, that uh, principals will help utilize and have in conversations to determine um, how teachers uh, will be identified, whether that's as a remote learning teacher or a um, in-person teacher. It also well, some teachers may be doing both, uh, depending on uh, what certification possibly they have or if they may be a singleton in that particular building, um, because we do have several teachers that are in that situation as well. So we'll be utilizing a mixture of data points, the skill, uh, skill assessment that teachers have uh, completed, certification will also be looked at as um, principals are working with staff and uh, human resources to determine how the staff and how will look for their building. Please, just to take back on that one, I have a quick question. You said that they could do both. They're not doing both at the same time. They're doing a class that could be remote and then a class that could be. It's possible in that regard, or it could be where students just like how we just did this board meeting that you have uh, students in the group of meets 
as the teacher is teaching the in-person students, the students are there, almost like similar to what you see in a distance learning class setup. Now, the will count, and there's some students that uh, may need an accommodation just like staff. Uh, some of our staff uh, members need accommodations in reference to they have some type of medical issue uh, that will go through the 504 process, and then there are a different uh, accommodation could be made, including face shield, depending on what the situation may be with the student. I got, I got, it's really not questions, Dr. Kenny, um, I guess I get your comments, so or giving my, giving my opinion yes, sir. on a couple of things, and, and uh, one is uh, the phasing process, I know Ms. McDonald uh, touched on it a little bit, but, but uh, aside from the from the principles on how this, because we, we heard from uh, some, some, some teachers that felt the need to come and, and speak about what they're being uh, asked to do on this phase in, and I think, I, 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 you know, I agree with Ms. McDonald that we should kind of phase it in with the younger kids, special needs, uh, and then we will progress on to middle school and high school, however, but, but to have an influx of everybody coming back at the same time, and we're having to do this social distancing and, uh, you know, disinfecting, cleaning, and all of that, I, I, I just feel like that would be a bit too much going from, going from zero to 100. Uh, I think it would be easier to go from zero to 25 or 50 instead of going from zero to 100 and letting everybody just, whether it's 80%, 57 or 60, um, they, they, they're doing virtual, but I, I just, I just, I'm just thinking about the one who's gonna be actually doing this at the school level, uh, how it's gonna impact them. Uh, that, that, is, that is my opinion about that. And another thing that I mentioned to Mr. Smith, this 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 this, this uh, in person remote learning plan is, is, is detailed, but but what what I'm used to and what I've seen and what what is what is done uh, in public safety is you have a, a standard operating procedure, which is just a one page bullet uh, of of what the day should look like from the time you get to work. What are you expecting to do? Who's going to be, you know, checking temperatures? Who, you know, it, 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 it's not as detailed as when it's plain, but it's a one, one page bullet that a person uh, can just look at and see how I'm supposed to be doing. This is what's supposed to be happening, uh, you know, when I first get to, get to work without having to go and research the different sections to find out what they're supposed to do. It, it just tells you that to consider, uh, you know, doing doing a one-page book, standard operating procedure, they call it an SOP, uh, so it can kind of simplify this document into something that a person can just pick up. And, and I see where you all have done something similar to that for us, the step-by-step employee self screen but uh, I think it needs to be done for what should happen in the course of the day that a person can just pick up and, and look at it without having to go through the detailed plan. Thank you for that feedback. Anything else for me? Okay, well, we have a recommendation. Do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I, I would like to motion, make a motion that uh, the school system uh, is given the okay to go ahead and uh, proceed with this transition to in-person remote learning plan. But I also like to uh, add a stipulation that if uh, the board is not satisfied that this is going as planned, 
that we have the option to go in and, and put a halt to uh, uh, the in-person uh, coming back into the building part and continue that remote. Uh, that, 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 that's my motion. Well, we definitely have a couple of meetings between now and, and the implementation of this, and it is going to be the responsibility of the, of the staff to, to have everything in place and answer those questions. And I think those walkthroughs hopefully will bring some reassurance and, and confidence to that. All right, so I have a motion second. and a second. Any further discussion? Speaking for me, no one else, just speaking for me. If, if I had to receive this detailed plan and, and was assured that we were getting the equipment and we were getting uh, the necessary processes in place, I, I would have I would have probably voted a little different if this was presented on the onset, not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm just I'm just stating how I feel about it, how this thing has progressed. Uh, this, this is all I wanted to see. Uh, but I, but I, I have to take it a little further. Uh, I'm not just going to, uh, and I told this to Mr. Smith and I, and I relayed it to the board members. Uh, I'm not just going to be satisfied with the presentation. Uh, this, this is something that, that, that I would personally make sure uh, it, it is, it is uh, monitored, it is revisited, and we see with our eyes that it's happening as it's been presented on paper and, and in PowerPoint. This is something that we cannot just uh, leave in the, in the hands of saying that it's going to get done. We're going to have to make sure that it gets done because this, this is something that uh, can affect people's lives. And, and, I, and, and I am not one to, to want to put people in uh, a compromised position uh, because someone has failed to actually lay eyes on what's supposed to be done. So, so this is something that I was looking for, but I want to take it a step further. We need to, make, as board members, we have, have to make sure that it's being done. We, we can't just sit in the boardroom and be satisfied with the presentation. We have to follow up and make sure things are being adhered to uh, as presented to us tonight. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is something I shared with Mr. Dahl prior to the meeting. If it takes Sue McDonald having a Zoom meeting with eight three teachers on this board, more than road teachers on this board, Spalding High, that's exactly what I suggest that we possibly do. Because I think the teachers will know whether we are ready with the cleanliness of the buildings, with the 
with the equipment they need to use, with the all the infrastructure that, that, that a teacher needs in a building, and, and everyone in this room knows I'm a teacher advocate, and as long as there's breath in me, I will be. So if it takes Zoom meetings for, for, for two weeks to convince me that we're ready, then I'm willing to do that. And I just wanted to make that public. That's something I discussed with the chair prior to this meeting. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a good idea, Ms. McDonald, since each school will have their own task force that they present to the Board of Education so that we can hear from them that they are ready, that things, conditions have improved. And, um, you know, I'm excited because we have done a lot of work, a lot of work has been put into this. And so hopefully we're able to move forward and it will be a win-win uh, situation for, for everybody. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, just make sure the record clear what motion is on the floor because it got confused a little bit with Mr. Holmes' said. My understanding is the motion on the floor is to approve the superintendent's recommendation to the real and I just want to make sure you That is correct. Chairman. And what Mr. Holmes mentioned, I just wanted to reassure him that we have a couple of meetings between now and then whatever we might want to do. Uh, all right, we have a motion and a second then. All in favor, signify by raising the pink card. Or a pen. <laughs> all right, we five vote. Mr. Chair, if I can all please follow up on what Mr. Holmes said, because we've understood that, that it's all in the execution plan. And so we want to be comfortable ourselves as we move forward in these next seven weeks that we're not saying something that becomes a real concern that jeopardizes the, the ability of us to pull this off successfully. So we've got every we've got every reason we're going to do the same thing that you do. I want to thank Dr. Kennedy and her task force because they have spent I'm not, I, I've actually forgot how many meetings we've had either, either six or seven I believe in the last two and a half to three weeks plus the subcommittee meetings of there on this as well. This was done uh, a lot of work has been while at the same time we're, we're working to get remote learning in place. And that was also going to step while we're working in this environment too. So I want to thank Dr. Kennedy and all who worked with her on this because the work, the work they did was truly a uh, Herculean task to pull this together. And I appreciate Mr. Holmes' comments because you've got to be able to execute The plan has got to be detailed as well. And so when we've had the plan looked at by these outside agents and given us the feedback on that, that's really not going to be all we stopped with. You saw some, some of my footage there, Clint Westbrook walking throughout the village, Lynn Polk out there. Those are going to continue as they see how well it's actually put in place and what the result of it is. So those walkthroughs were just, that, that wasn't anywhere near the end of that. We want to work very closely with those agencies and use the resources that they have to make our plan better and make it more effective. So that is definitely a piece of this. So thank you, Dr. King, and her people. Thank you, and I just have to commend the Star Schools Task Force. I can't leave them up here. Uh, all the hard work, all of the members of the subcommittee, a big thank you for all of the work that you've put in and all the time that you've given to uh, this important work for our students and staff. All right, thank you. Well, members, we're moving on to uh, the revision uh, to the policy of the JCGB R1 and R2. Uh, Mr. Anthony Akins.
spread of infectious disease. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Normally, a council revision requires us to do 30 days in the table and do this as an emergency because it does get in a plan to be trying to put it in place and there's a little more urgency to having this done. We talked about where you're going to ask all along, so it's really not the thing. Okay, so uh, I have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor of Senate Five O Eight, Lee Pink Car. Wonderful, Lee Five O. And then we'll move on to the thermographic cameras first. I just want to make a motion that we agree with the extra This. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have to go and make a vote. Thermographic cameras is one of the things that we're looking forward to assist with not only the temperature checks coming in. Uh, it streamlines this for us so that we're not having to have someone there checking each two as they come in. Uh, the thermographic cameras that we looked at uh, will serve to check, uh, I think, roughly seven each two per minute uh, coming through. Um, you actually saw a piece of it on the demo where it faced it, puts it on the face, he was due to cold and the blood go hot liquid did not pick up just the taste. Uh, the other piece that it does do for us, uh, it will sound an alert if someone does come in without a mask on to tell them that they are not wearing a mask. So it just alerts us for that. Uh, the cameras that we're looking at, um, we, uh, Mr. Ballard um, did a proposal out. We checked prices. Uh, we have about eight different prices. Um, uh, Corestone, was the lowest price. Uh, if you notice a little bit, it may have been a little confusing. He just totaled out because he got a per uh, unit price and then he went ahead and just totaled out the quarter stone because they were the lowest um, by several, several hundred dollars. But it includes the thermal camera, it includes uh, the NVR that goes with it, uh, includes the software that we need to operate. Uh, it also is a height vision. Uh, if you read anything about uh, Fayetteville, they determined that's the best one out there, that's the one we've used all along, that's what I've said. It, it integrates with our security system already. Uh, so we're looking at that uh, with a total of $249,053 to purchase the thermal camera sufficient for each school to be able to check uh, temperatures. Okay, any, any questions for me? I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Brown and second by Mr. McDonald. Any further discussion? All in favor of the five of the pink bar. That's a great move. Thank you. Five All right, board members, um, we'll move on to our information for the Georgia School Board Association. You got the four-page announcement. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, Mr. Q about you know, any changes cosmetically might need to be made. His recommendations are to go with it as it is. He does want to provide a couple of links. One link, is he in the room? I just don't want to One link will be to a video of our system and the community so that it can, someone that is, you know, possibly looking and see that. And then the other link will be to some information about Fulton County and the uh, economic development that has taken place there. So, were there any other thoughts or comments about that? Are we good with it? No, I was just for the general public that's still watching, I would like for you to just go over the uh, anticipated timeline that, you know, it could be at any point, but just to go over that timeline to the general public. Sure, and I think that we could probably make this timeline then available on our website if we have it. Uh, but as we uh, get the announcement together, we will submit it to uh, GSBA this week. Uh, they will then put the announcement out on Monday of next week. Uh, board members, we also need to make a decision. I think we're already in the unanimous of this, that we do want to do a community survey also. So they will, GSBA will give us, get us a copy of that so we can see what that looks like. We will then try to post both the, uh, the announcement of the position 
and a survey, and those will run until the 18th of October. Um, and then uh, GSBA will deliver us the finalized application in their tiered order that they talked about uh, the week of the first week of November. We will then do our uh, application process and do that, and we have a 14-day period of time that we have to allot within that, so, so we can get that proposed timeline out there for everybody. Everybody good? Yes. Really good? All right. Um, a lot of information items that were here uh, in your packet for members. Make sure that you look at all of those. Um, take just a minute for some um, board member comments. I'll start at my right, the sunset at my left. I want to say thank you to everyone who has worked on the reopening plans and presentations and subcommittees and everything. Thanks so much for your hard work to ensure that the scholars of the school district will be safe. Also, thank you so much for listening to the community, including those parents and scholars on the reopening task force. And I'm looking forward to see what happens next. Look at the comments. All right. Cool. I want to thank the faculty, the teachers, for the tremendous job that they have done during this time. Uh, I just hear so many positive comments from parents, from teachers, from students. It's been a very trying time, but teachers have risen to the occasion. And I heard a quote recently that I want to share with you. You know, sometimes we draw from Chick-fil-A, uh, but we put little notes on the bags, and there's a quote on the bag that said, you never know how strong you are until strong is the only option. And our teachers and our students, our administrators, have all risen to the occasion and become extremely strong through this process. And I salute each one of you. It has not been an easy task, but you've done it with grace. Please make sure I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I echo what Ms. Cook and Ms. Brown said about the staff hard work, but I, I also want to thank uh, the board members for uh, how we dealt with our differences, uh, how we dealt with this process. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of first in that right now, Sarah. <laughs> I've seen it go a lot worse to the left, but uh, I just want to let you all know I, I appreciate how we dealt with our differences, uh, and I'm always looking to reach a resolution that, that that way, you know, each party can take away something. So I, I think we came to a workable resolution tonight. Uh, uh, I, I, I uh, really am proud to say that I you know, work with a board that we didn't succumb to pressure uh, that was put on us from uh, various sources. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to the board members for, for the work on how we got to this, this point uh, about returning to school, as well as thanking the staff and the superintendent for the work that they done. Uh, it's not an easy process. We're in uncharted waters. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm always an optimistic person that, that we will prevail. We may have to go through some things, we may have to lose some things, we may have to, uh, you know, share some pain, but, but we can't make it through. You know, I, I just think we just have to continue to operate like we are openly, honestly, uh, respecting each other's uh, opinions and thoughts. So uh, I say to everybody, who knows, and thank you for the hard work. Absolutely. Thank you, So, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank you all, all as I do every meeting, thank all of you in this room and outside of this room that have contacted me. And I, when I met with Mr. Steph last week, there were a couple of things. Number one, 
everyone that is contacting me, they're not complaining like Mr. Key said earlier. They're, they have concerns. So I thank you for letting me know those concerns so I can share with my colleagues in the system. So, so there's a big difference in concerns and complaints in my mind. You know, sometimes you just run into people that's, that's all they do is complain. These are just genuine concerns. And I would also ask that the board and this system, and I spoke to Mr. Doss about this earlier, is that we consider, because I would like to leave on good news, that we consider giving all of our certified staff $150 stipend to get their classrooms ready for the um, PPE they need in their own rooms to make their, their classrooms safer. And again, I brought this up many weeks ago, elementary furniture. It's not designed for social distancing with the table, and I understand that they're still going to continue to do small group learning, which they should. And if we give uh, money to our teachers to make their rooms safer and to make their furniture work for them, I think that um, that would be something that we could do for our teachers. Because, you know, teachers can solve issues probably in just a matter of hours. Buy them a box lunch and say thanks. So I would hope that we would be able to do that. Just $150 stipend for all of our certified staff to get their rooms ready with regard to, I've seen pictures on the internet where teachers are using clear shower curtains to make that a little bit safer as far as, you know, social distancing. Um, we've all seen the plexiglass, but I understand that that's in short supply. And I would ask our community, the schools that your children go to, just donate equipment to help make our teachers' rooms in their front, especially in the elementary schools where the, they do a lot of small group. Just donate material to your school that your children go to. I think that would be a great way we can bring this all together as we transition our kids back to school. So I would ask that we consider giving $150 to all of our certified staff, our community health, their local schools where your children go, and um, let's make our classrooms safer for the teachers that are going to be in. And again, thank you to all. I'd also like to ditto all the comments that went toward all of our teachers and the hard work and the administrators and the uh, central office staff. Um, I know that this is this situation, COVID, everything has taken up a lot of our time. I'm looking forward to be able to get back to some of those other priorities that have, we have kind of put on the back burner, uh, but need to continue to address in our system. So. Um, there are announcements there. They've already been said. Board members, we have one small item for executive session. It won't take very long. Uh, so I would entertain a motion then to go into executive session. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Holmes and a second by Ms. Barnum. So good. For the purpose of, um, remember, teacher evaluation, personnel evaluation. Uh, and all in favor signify by putting your right hand or you can. 